and welcome to day 11. It is the penultimate day of the festival and we have um, another full day for you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe? Um, so we have the Caribbean Translation Project. We have Lawrence Schimmel and Inclusive Kids Books. We have um, Manon and um, Caroline from Hono Press. And then last, but very much not least, we have Margot Eckenberg on Nelly Campabeo. So, um, the Caribbean Translation Project is run by Alicia McKenzie. It's basically like a Twitter feed and a blog um, on sort of just books from the Caribbean in translation and um, that doesn't just look like translation into English but in between all of the languages of the Caribbean. Um, obviously given the sort of publishing cycle that we um, have globally um, that means translation to and from French, Spanish, Dutch and English primarily. Um, however, um, it sort of kickstarts a conversation um, that we are hoping to follow um, on sort of translation from endangered languages, um, from indigenous languages, and then um, obviously, as we have already done this year, um, we've talked a lot about Creoles, which don't necessarily need translation into English, but like a French-based Creole um, or a French-influenced Creole would need translation. So, you know, like, sort of, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, Alicia is lovely um, and she sort of talks through some books. If you're looking for any recommendations, that's a good talk to go for, to for, to, for some books um, to have a read. Then we have um, Lauren Schimmel on inclusive children's books. So, you know, sort of the undeniably best thing about Lawrence's books is that, um, you know, all of the intersections um, that reflect the reality of the world we live in are covered, um, but they're not necessarily centered and focus focused. Obviously, like, you know, that is important too. Like I don't I don't mean that a book is any the worse for doing that, but um when you're talking about children's books where you know the word count total in some of these board books is 20, you know, it doesn't um it's just refreshing to have like real visibility in there um, and shout out to all the illustrators that work on Lawrence's books too um, because they do a good job. Um, so um, and then we have um, the lovely man on Stefan Ross and Caroline Oakley. So Caroline is the editor at Hono Press, which is a Welsh women's press that's been around since the 80s. In fact, Mena Elvin said herself that she donated to the first round of like crowdfunding, basically, um, to set up Hono Press. And they've been going ever since. And um, so they have published Manon's book, um, The Seasoning, which is um, this wonderful fusing of recipes and food and a story. Manon and um, Caroline and I then have a bit of chat about Welsh publishing in general and what we'd like to see um, more of basically more in translation oh my god what a surprise did I surprise you I hope so um, and then last but not least we have Margaret Eckenberg on Nelly Campabeo this is a personal sort of project of mine. I will never not recommend Nelly Campfeo. Um, her book, Cartuccio, is sort of the only book we believe to be the only written account of the Mexican Revolution from a female perspective. Um, and it's wonderful. It's um, these series of vignettes um, that are both personal and entirely centered on her family and her family's experiences and um you know depict the mexican revolution and what it was like to actually um be there and be in it um it's incredible and margot was just wonderful um i couldn't have asked for anyone better to sort of explain that book and um, it just gave me so much joy and um you know i think margot um she taught me things and um, we had a really um, lovely discussion about Nelly's work and um, I would just highly recommend it. Um, I think, you know, it's one of those books, it's £25, it's difficult, you know, um, push or whatever, but um, it's incredibly worth it. I hope that you enjoy this penultimate day of Girl Half um, and I really look forward to seeing you tomorrow as we wrap things up for 2021. Um, so yeah. <laughs>
Hey, but thank you so much for watching and enjoy these highlights. Goodbye. So the, the Caribbean Translation Project is, as it says, it's a project, it's a plan to promote the translation of Caribbean writing, books from the Caribbean uh, by Caribbean writers, and also books about the, the Caribbean, which might not necessarily be by Caribbean writers. Um, and this started after the translation of my novel, Sweetheart. So th this, the novel was translated in 2016 as Trezor. And uh, the translation uh, or the translated version uh, won a prize uh, called the Prix Carbe de Lycien. And uh, with that prize, winners get to go to the French Caribbean and meet the, the students who actually administer the prize. Um, so I, I went to Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Guyane and met some amazing students, uh, men in the last two years of, of, of high school. And we spoke about Caribbean literature and you know how uh, how you can increase access uh, to, to to books uh, by uh, translation. And uh, so that was the that was the start. And then the following year, um, I I was in Jamaica, and uh, you know the, the same thing. I was at a, uh, a literary festival, I, I think, if I recall <laughs> correctly, and. Uh, that uh, also came up. So I decided to, to launch the project. Um, and at, at the moment, it's, you know, myself and, and a few friends. And uh, th this is what we try to do. We try to promote the translation of, of Caribbean writing and books about the Caribbean. Visibility is important, but it's not the only goal, I think. And so, you know, and there's many things that are at play of, who has access to um, telling their stories and to being published, you know, to finding uh, a platform as it is, or to making their own platforms if they're being denied platforms by the um, overall the corporate uh, publishing thing. You know, I've published a lot of books. Very often my books are being published um, more often with independent publishers rather than corporate publishers. I have published with corporate publishers as well. Very often those books are, um, you know, I, I remember years ago being shocked that, you know, I was published by uh, a large publishing house in New York that publishes around 600 books a year. And I learned that, you know, they had three publicists for 600 books. I got two days of a publicist's attention. That was it. Um, and I don't think I got a full two days because you have the bestsellers who get, you know, attention, extra attention. And so they took, you know, half of a day of my, <laughs> of my two days worth of, of publicist attention. And so, and that's just the reality of, you know, the big corporate publishers. At the same time, a small publisher that maybe does 12 books a year, every book is, you know, vitally important to their list and to their catalog. And very often they're publishing, not just to throw them out in the world and see what sticks, but also that um, they're publishing sort of long-term if that makes sense. So there are some books I have with small independent publishers, but that they'll backlist and still be selling a thousand copies a year, even 10 years after publication, you know, and, and that's something that, um, this is something very different with children's books than with the adult world, where every few years you have a new audience so that the audience renews itself. And so as long as a book is in print, it can still uh, continue to find new readers much more easily, I think, than adult books. There's so many adult books that are, um, published that just the avalanche of new titles um, at bookstores just bumps you know your book off of the new the new the new release table and that it's very hard to get um, bookstores to reorder aside from the independents that will fall in love with books and support you know books and authors and things like that but um, just it, at the chains it's just so the churn is just so constant that it's very difficult to um, one thing I'll mention I mean you did mention the um, that I have some books about sexuality. So uh, even um, these are two board books I have. These are the ones that'll be coming out in Welsh uh, later in uh, September, um, translated by Mary Sean and Ellen Haaf um, into Welsh. There's also an English edition that'll be coming out in the UK, uh, which is interesting because it's a self-translation, um, a rhyming self-translation. And the books are also coming out in English in Canada and in uh, New Zealand. 
And all of the English translations, even though they're all my self-translation, are very different. So uh, the Welsh translation, for instance, uh, so um, this book this is about a boy and a cat. Uh, he wakes up early and the cat's the only one who's awake. His two moms and his sister are still asleep. So in the Welsh English version, it says ma'am instead of mum or mom. And yeah. so, you know, little, uh, little differences. Uh, this one is about a, a girl who's trying to go to bed and her dog wants to play. And uh, she just happens to have two dads and the dog gets jealous and steals her bear, hijinks in Sue. Um, so in this one, whether it's a teddy bear, whether it's a stuffy, there's all these regional things. What I was going to say though is that uh, sometimes they're published by traditional publishers. Sometimes they're published, um, for instance, these were published in Switzerland by a um, NGO that supports rainbow families. And so, um, you know, there's lots of, that's the German one. Actually, I love just to say, so the Spanish title is No es hora de jugar. So it's not time to play. And I think in English, it's being called Bedtime, not Playtime. But the German mm -hmm. title, Hundenbude, is Dog Tired. And I just think that's wonderful. I would, I want to change the original. <laughs> the girls who set the company up did. Um, it was basically set up because a number of women who, were, who had been at Abba Uni together um, were all keen literature fans, big readers, and had identified the fact that there was a distinct lack of Welsh women's writing being published within the small presses in Wales at the time, both in English and in Welsh. Um, and it was kind of the beginning of the second wave of feminism. They were aware of the rise of the women's press in Virago and wanted to set, set up an equivalent in Wales. And they began very, very small, literally round a kitchen table in Cardiff, I believe. Um, and they raised the money for their first two titles by doing a share issue. So approaching all their networks, all the women that they knew and asking them if they'd like to contribute and buy a share in their emerging cooperative and pay for the first two books. So that's how it began. Um, they then slowly expanded their publishing program until they were in a position to apply to the Welsh Books Council, now the Books Council of Wales, for a, what's currently called a revenue grant. So that gives you money in advance towards your expenses for publishing. And I think in between the two, they were able to get funds from the Arts Council of Wales on an individual title by title basis. And so what does Hono do and what's sort of the aim of Hono as a press as it currently exists now then? Um, as we currently exist, we still have very much the same ethos and the same MEMS and arts. Um, we, we're run as a cooperative. Um, we have a voluntary management committee who look after the publishing and the staff. We now have, I think, 1.3 full-time equivalent staff. So that we each have different responsibilities, but none of us are completely full-time. Um, and we still publish both in Welsh and English, and we're currently expanding our contemporary Welsh output. Um, so we currently publish 10 new books in the English language per annum, plus one or two others if we get extra commission and grants. And one new Welsh title every two years and one classic Welsh language title every two years. I, I, was, I wasn't I was sure that I wanted to translate my book. I wasn't sure if it was translatable. It's a really odd thing if you live in a culture where, you know, I speak, I was brought up through the medium of Welsh. It's my first language. I speak Welsh with my own kids. I do most of my work through the medium of Welsh. And I, it, it's hard in that situation to know if what you write creatively will work in another language because there's, there's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing. And the, the seasoning or blasted as it was in Welsh felt to me before translation um, that it was a novel that was so intrinsically Welsh that I didn't know if it would feel forced um, if, if it was translated and read in the English language, but actually it was a, a process that I really enjoyed unexpectedly. So, you know, I, I really did. I hadn't 
written in English since school mm. and it was like finding a new toy you know oh I can use all these words as well it was great and, and just to explore the novel again um in another language and to see how it feels differently um in English and what what how does it feel differently because I I also feel like it and clearly you've conveyed something in the English language version that also feels intrinsically Welsh and it's you know it's centered on an incredibly you know it's a it's a Welsh community that's very mm. recognizable in lots of ways and to people who've grown up in Wales even you know even though I'm from a very different part of Wales that definitely doesn't have the same um Kai for communities but maybe some of the same people <laughs> yeah I think for me the biggest differences because I, I had never translated my own work before and I've gone on afterwards to translate uh, a few more books but I, I was quite scared of the process and I translated it almost word for word to begin with and then I went back and, and tried to smooth it and see and began to you know feel a bit more confident and feel that I was able to mess around a bit a little bit more um, but the, the biggest shock for me was that in Welsh, it feels a lot darker. Um, and the people who have read it in Welsh and English, they say the same. It just feels like a really dark, heavy novel in Welsh. And it's just that little bit lighter in English. I don't, I don't know what that is, but I wonder if it's to do with the um, literary landscape in, in Welsh. Um, that somehow there are references in there or just nods in there to other novels that have um, talked about similar sort of themes. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I wonder if it is something like that, just a kind of cultural knowledge of Welsh things. And of course, things have a different soul in every language. I do feel that it's a different, it feels like a different novel to me. The subjective no novel in that she's writing these, as you say, vignettes, vignettes or episodes or sort of almost like little flashes of her own memories of, of her childhood. And she's going to do so in a really extraordinary way in which we see a different kind of writing about violence. So not sort of the sanctioned idea of war, but rather the personal experience of war. And not only through, told through a woman's point of view, but a child, so a girl. And I think, you know, when we think about literature um, in general, the number of sort of extraordinary characters who jump up at us and who are girls can really be counted on just a few hands, right? That's changed quite a bit, but girls tend to be quite invisible. And certainly in a situation of war, nobody's paying attention to the girls. And yet here we have these tales of war told specifically by, the, the the this voice this very original voice of a of a child and then we have an interesting kind of play in the novel too in which the much older nelly is remembering the younger nelly so there are times you will have noticed right where there, you, you can be a little bit confused about the narrative voice is this the nelly writing in mexico city uh, in the 30s or is this the child who's in chihuahua in, in 1914 15 so it can be a little bit confusing but i think it's really important to to, to point out that not only is her novel extremely original in this way, um, but it's also a different way of writing. And I think that this is something really important as well to keep in mind with, with Nellie. Um, she's, she is on the one hand trying to, and she was criticized for this, she was trying to also defend the name of the revolutionary Pancho Villa, who in the in, in Mexico City in the in the 20s and 30s when she arrives here, she's dismayed to find out that he's considered a bandit and a criminal. And this was her hero growing up. Her mother was a supporter um, of Avia and actually helped him storing arms and so forth in the house. So she's trying to rewrite that history of Villa as another kind of, as a, as a hero as opposed to a villain. Yet at the same time, she also writes about all of those unnamed soldiers, all of those victims of the war who have no names or who are not remembered and not recorded. And I think that that's the really key element um, of Cartucho that helps us distinguish it from the more traditional novels of the, of the Mexican Revolution. 
um, where yes, we have sort of this sense of like who's fighting on the, the side of the, the, the federal side government and who's, who's or, or the military forces at the time and who's in the revolutionary troops. But in Cartucho, we have this sense of everyday people in her own town who she knew and who are being murdered constantly. And so writing this idea of writing about the dead men of her childhood, as she says, can, can seem kind of shocking to us because this is a child's perspective. But that was her reality. And so she's very much trying to convey to us these little episodes of her own childhood and what it meant personally. But also, I think it can be another narrative of the Mexican Revolution itself. <laughs> 